Hi, welcome to Light the Camera Author. I'm Jim Juno, and if you know anything about knockabout comedy, slapstick comedy, you have probably heard of the Three Stooges. And if you're thinking of the Three Stooges, you probably think of Curly, Moe, and Larry. The one with Curly, the rotund, uh, yuck, yuck, yuck person, and, and Moe, the, the leader of the group who's always dishing out the punishment, and Larry with the porcupine hair. But before Curly, I'm sorry, yeah, before Curly and be, and after Curly was Shemp. And Bert Kearns is the author. He has a new book out coming out in October called Shemp. It is the story of Shemp Howard. And Bert, tell me a little bit about Shemp, the Shemp days of the Stooges. Well, Shemp Howard is really known as the fourth Stooge. But I think in reality, we find out that Shemp really could be called the first stooge. You know, when, we, when I started this book, there had not been a book about Shemp Howard published before. When I started writing this, there had been books on Mo, Larry, Curly, Joe Dorita, and, and Joe Besser. There had been books on all of them, but nothing on Shemp. Uh, so when I went into this book, it was really an exploration for me. This might be the first Three Stooges biography that was written by someone who's not an ultra stooge fan. All these books are written by members of that stooge community. I'm not. I liked the, the stooges when I was a kid. I grew up, kind of grew out of the stooges, but found the story of, of Shemp Howard to be kind of fascinating. The fact that this guy had a, a long career in show business. He's become sort of a cult figure just because of that face of his that's, you know, that, that that pops up in Drew Friedman's art and shows up elsewhere. Robert Crumb does pictures of Shemp, et cetera. So go, going into his, his story, uh, it, it was, I began it as a, as a, as a pop culture writer and reporter. I started digging into it and was really amazed to find that out of all the, the, the great entertainment acts of the 20th century, the icons, the history of the Three Stooges is so clouded in mythology and lies that it became an entirely different kind of project for me, digging through what was true and what wasn't and finding the real story. I can imagine. And like you said, he could be considered the first stooge. And and that is not hyper that's not hyperbole. I mean, that him and Mo. Well, let's let's go back a little bit. Mo, Shemp, and Curly were all brothers, right. which is which is rare nowadays. And then Shemp and Mo got together and formed an act. Matter of fact, I think the earliest the earliest film footage is of Mo and Shemp at some at some event in 1924. I'm not sure what it was, but right. um, but Shemp came first with Ted Healy and Mo. Um, and he was actually the one who really taught Mo, I guess, and later on Larry, how to do all the all the knockabout tricks they did. Yeah, Shemp was two years older than Mo. He was the older brother. Uh, uh, Curly was about eight years younger. He was the he was the baby of the family. He came along much later. But Mo, from the beginning, has set himself up as the center of the group. And one of the problems with going through Three Stooges history is everything goes back to the book that Mo Howard wrote. It was originally called Mo Howard and the Three Stooges. He died before he finished it. His daughter helped finish it. It was known as um, I Stooge to Conquer. And th this was <laughs> this was the, the Holy Grail. This is the Bible of, of Three Stooges history. And for a while there, every book that was written, every story that was told went back to what Mo wrote in this book. Mo also survived the other Stooges. You know, Curly died in, in the 1950s. So did Shemp. Larry was infirm. Uh, Mo was making television appearances, showing up on the Mike Douglas show, showing up and telling his story of the Three Stooges history. And as he told it, it started like this. Mo was friends with Ted Healy when they were kids. Ted Healy became a popular vaudeville entertainer. They met up when, when Mo grew up in 1923. Mo joined the show as one of Healy's stooges. Later, Mo got, recruited his brother Hurley, uh, his brother Shemp. 
they were out on the road when Mo and Ted Healy were at a nightclub in Chicago and they saw this little guy with frizzy hair performing on the stage and sawing away at a violin. It was Larry Feinberg, later known as Larry Fine. Mo looked at Ted Healy and said, are you thinking what I'm thinking? And they hired Larry. And then it was, it was Mo, Larry, and Shemp. Well, then Shemp comes up to Mo after a couple of years and says, you know, I got a deal to go out to Hollywood to be in these Joe Palooka films. And Mo said, do it, brother. We just go, go, go do it. We'll get Curly to take over the act. And that was it. It was a clean, unbroken streak for Mo. And Mo was, as Mo put it, you know, the leader from the beginning. When they left Ted Healy, Mo said, I was smart. I took Healy's role. I, you know, Healy used to deliver the punches and the slaps to these three little guys. Now Mo is going to deliver the punches and the slaps. Well, Mo's story isn't true. Mo had left the act in 1925 for three years to sell real estate with his mother after he got married. Shemp was on the road for, during that time with Ted Healy, made his debut on Broadway, was reviewed in the New York Times, was a hit on the road in vaudeville, and was sitting next to Ted Healy when they saw Larry Feinberg performing in a club in Chicago and said, are you thinking what I'm thinking? And then Shemp went and trained Larry Fine on what to do in the show and went off on his own for a few months. So everything goes back to what Mo Howard wrote and what Mo Howard said in a very self-aggrandizing way to keep up the mythology that the Three Stooges were very much the way they are on the screen. Mo is the leader. Curly is the, you know, the clown, the larger than life figure. Larry is sort of the everyman, the middleman. And Shemp is the scaredy cat, bedwetting, phobic, you know, scaredy cat with Mo. When really, when you look at the history of the Three Stooges, you don't really think that Shemp was that phobic at all. He had some fears. He had some panic attacks. He was a sensitive artist. But he did a, very many more brave things than Mo did. And I think Mo, this is going to get people angry, I think. But I think, you know, Mo <laughs> was jealous of Shemp. Shemp did what Mo wanted to do. He established himself as... A, as a semi-star, as a you know, as a working actor in films for a dozen years before he came back and joined his brothers. You know, we're talking about events which, which happened over a hundred years ago now. Yeah. How did how were you able to go back and discern what was true as opposed to what was the Mo version, so to speak? Well, that that, that was the interesting part. First of all. I had all the books. I had everything that's been written on everybody. And I had some people in the Stooges community wouldn't cooperate with me, didn't want to deal with me. Didn't, I was an outsider. They had, uh, they had, you know, other alliances and allegiances. They didn't, so that's fine. But I had their books. I, I got to see what was written. I look at the first book by, by um, Larry Fine. He tells his history. Then I read a second book and find out that, that first book was not really written by Larry. It was written by a collaborator who had threatened Larry and taken his money and made up the book, made up the whole story. That was called um, uh, A Stroke of Luck. Larry did never even wrote that book. Then there was a second book that was written by Mo Feinberg, who was Larry's uh, brother, also mostly fiction. You can throw that book out. <laughs> but comparing dates, going back, I mean, this is going back to the, the, the trades, newspaper reviews, looking into the, the Columbia records and seeing interviews with people who worked at, at, at the studios, et cetera, and matching up verifiable dates and reviews and, and reportage with what was written. And you find out that he, here's the real story. I mean, on the, uh, midway through this process, I'm realizing I'm sort of rewriting Three Stooges history here. You know, some of it's out there, some of it's ignored, but now it's it's there. It's, it's 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 in print, and you can go back and you can find all the resources for it. You know, and you mentioned that uh, that um, all the books, all the things that have been written, has mostly been from um, Mo Howard and the Three Stooges, or I Stooge to Conquer, uh, whatever title it's out. Uh, there was also a book uh, called the Three Stooges Scrapbook, which yeah. borrowed heavily from. Uh, again, it was written by Joan Marr uh, and her, I believe, her husband. Which they were Joan, uh, they were I'm sorry, Mo's uh, daughter. Yeah. 
So we know that. So we know that it's from that angle, that same angle as the Mo Howard book. Um, you know, you just, you met some resistance. You said, and that's what you know. I had not realized that the Stooge community. And by the way, Stooges are a term used just for uh, back in the vaudeville days. They were the assistants, weren't they, to the right. star? Right. And and they weren't even known as, as Healy's original three Stooges. After Mo, after Mo, Shemp, and Larry quit the Stooges, he hired some he hired some some new Stooges and called them his Stooges. They were for the first they weren't even like the original Stooges with, with Healy, which is also an interesting thing. They never really used the term. Yeah, and so they were the so they were his his pawns, so to speak, Healy's pawns. Um, and Mo made it sound like Healy and him were close friends, but really, and and like you said, Shemp was the one who was scared of Healy. That's why he left the act, because right. he was scared of him. Um, but if he stayed with him for three years. He couldn't have been that scared of him. Well, when you look at the reviews, and you can even look at when you see the, the one film they made together, uh, Soup to Nuts, this is they, they weren't they didn't even get billing in, in the film, but they were they they recreated a lot of their stage show. And you can see in that film that Shemp, a little bit taller than Mo and Larry, was the star of the act. And in all the reviews and and, and all the, the special features that, that were done, it was Healy and Shemp. Shemp was what was the main person. Shemp had a lot, a lot more talent than Mo did. He was much more versatile. He could dance, he was funny, he had a funny face. He was a master at ad living, uh, which you know Mo had his thing where he was shorter and he 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 could be angry and he would slap Larry around a bit when Healy turned his back, but but really you saw from the beginning that in in those early years when they were on stage, Shemp was the star of the show and those three years that he spent alone in the act without Mo, he, his star only rose to where he was getting credit when they were on Broadway. He was getting credit with his name in the, in the the, the same type size as Ted Healy's when they were in something like a, a night in in Spain. Yes. So so it seemed that that Mo uh, really wanted everyone to think that he he in real life he had the same role that he did in in the team, which was he was he was the smart one. He was the mastermind, and everyone else worked for Mo, which really that wasn't really what, the way things were working. I remember uh, uh, one story. Well, you know, well, a lot of people don't realize that Shemp, when he left the Stooges, he built a, a really good career, um, not just in the Joe Paluca shorts, but also with some some pretty big name movies. I mean, I believe he was in a couple of Abbott and Costello movies. He was in five Abbott and Costello movies. I five, mean, yeah. That's the thing. Just going back to why Shemp left, left the Stooges. You read the books from Mo, you hear the, the testimony. He was afraid. He was afraid of, of Ted Healy. He was tired of getting slapped around and stuff. That wasn't the case at all. And this is verified by reports in the trades at the time. Shemp was the star of, of this act. He wanted more money. And Ted Healy said to him, I pay you three guys a certain amount of money. If you want more money, change the split with Mo and Larry. And they weren't going to do that. And they, and they weren't going to give uh, Shemp any, any more money. So Shemp quit the act because he thought he was worth more. And he went off on his own. And that and meanwhile, that, that goes totally against this story of Shemp being this scaredy cat. That most are, I mean, Mo wrote a book. He wrote a biography, an autobiography. And he writes about his, his older brother from the time he's a child he says, you know, my, my other two brothers, the two older brothers who, who didn't go into show business, they were very good at school. They were very smart. Shemp, no, he, he, he was always going to flunk out of school. He was a whining, crying baby. If I got hit, Shemp would cry louder and scream, and, and he was always bawling and crying. Then his daughter writes, uh, Mo's daughter writes a book about Curly, and she says, when Shemp was a baby, he held everything in. He never cried. And it's like, well, what, what's going on here? The worst, I think, is that Shemp was inducted into the army during World War I. In 1918, he was drafted. 
He went in, he went into the into the army, went to basic training in the Carolinas, uh, and then he was he was um, discharged a number of months later because he was part of the October replacement draft, which was they were replacing soldiers who were being killed in Europe, and then the armistice was signed, and Shemp was 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 let go. It was discharged along with many other soldiers. Mo writes in his autobiography, and I just say, who would write this about their late older brother? Yeah. He says the reason that he was that he left was because he was a bedwetter, and you know if he was in if he was in the navy, they might not have noticed. Ha ha! But Shemp was a bedwetter, and that's why he that he, why he was kicked out of the army. And and there's no record of that. I saw I saw his discharge records. He wasn't discharged because he had that any kind of condition like that. There's no medical discharge, but that was a way of Mo carrying on this image of Shemp, which just so happened to fit in with the image of Shemp, the stooge on screen. You know, you know, that's Shemp, horrible you, though. I mean, that, you, that is really horrible. You, you, you mentioned, you <laughs> mentioned great roles that, that Shemp had in, in the dozen years that he was solo. He appeared in films, you know, alongside John Wayne and Randolph Scott and Marlena Dietrich, very famous uh, by, by being in the bank dick with W.C. Fields. You know, he did five films with Abbott and Costello. When Abbott and Costello was was really were really hot in 1941 and 1942, um, Universal couldn't make Abbott and Costello films fast. They couldn't get Abbott and Costello pictures out quick enough. So they started making Abbott and Costello pictures without Abbott and Costello. And there's one great one called uh, San Antonio Rose, where Shemp is teamed up with another actor as sort of the Abbott and Costello team in this film. I think the Andrew sisters are in it. The other actor is Lon Chaney Jr. And Lon oh, Chaney Jr. is not funny at all. And he, he, he'll admit that. <laughs> and he slaps around Shemp in this film. It's like a horror. It's like one of the later horror films. When he's, he's slapping Shemp, it hurts to watch. It's like worse than Ted Healy could, could ever do. But there it was. And Shemp, Shemp did that. And then Shemp later starred... The one film that you can probably say Shemp starred in was called Private Buckaroo. And very much like Buck Privates, it was, it was a, a kind of a recruitment comedy. And the Andrew sisters were in it. And Joey Lewis was in it. And Mary Wicks played um, Shemp's girlfriend. And Shemp really stars in this one. And he's great. He's, he, he's hilarious in it. And it's a, you know, a B picture, but it's still out there. People can see it on YouTube, Private Buckaroo. And that's, that's Shemp at his finest as a solo performer. You know, he, uh, so he's on his own. He's having a successful career. And then Curly in 1945 suffers a debilitating stroke. After, after 12 years after, after Shemp left, uh, how, and of course, um, you know, you mentioned Columbia. Um, was Shemp with Columbia Pictures on, when he was on his own? No, interestingly enough, he was with uh, Vitaphone, which was uh, a Warner Brothers subsidiary based in Brooklyn. It used to be Vitagraph Studios back in the 1920s. Uh, Shemp did a lot of shorts and pictures on the East Coast. Uh, he, he went out in around 1938, headed West, moved to Beverly Hills, and was working mostly with Universal Pictures. And also as a freelance, he was working for a number of studios, did you know, some on Poverty Row, but he was also working with Universal. In 1944, he, he he lost his contract at Universal, went over to Columbia, but was also working at other studios as well, but wound up getting basically pulled into Columbia in 1944. Coincidentally, which is very interesting, this was right about the time that Curly Howard was starting to fade. He had the first of his strokes. He was he was slowing down. He was kind of slurring in some in some of the comedies. He couldn't, you know, some of them he was really great in, other ones he wasn't. And Shemp was was on the lot. He was he was on the Columbia lot. They gave him some roles in, in some picture in some pictures, but they had him doing short films. And he was doing shorts that were directed by like Jules White, who was in charge of the Three Stooges yeah. comedies. And he was doing a lot of reheated scripts. He even did an old Three Stooges script here and there. And he was working with the Three Stooges uh, support team and supporting actors. So it almost seemed as if. They kind of had him there. They knew, hey, we got Shemp Howard here because it looks like Curly's not going to last. And um, 1945, about a year or so before uh, Curly had the most debilitating stroke, 
uh, Mo had taken the, the team out on the road. Hurley wasn't doing well. He, he, he was in, he was in bad health. And despite that, you know, whenever they weren't working on the, the, the studio lot, they were making their money doing personal appearances. Mo would get them out on the road. And they, they, they did a, two weeks in San Francisco. And from there, they went down to New Orleans and Curly collapsed. And, and they, had, they put him in a sanitarium in Santa Barbara. And Mo somehow got Shemp to come down to New Orleans and fill in for Curly in a, in a live performance. And if you saw the newspaper ad in New Orleans, they had a picture of the Three Stooges, Mo, Larry, and Curly, and pasted Shemp's head on Curly's body. Oh my gosh! Oh, that that lasted Curly. one that lasted one show. They had to cancel the tour because people, you know, people wanted to see Curly. They, he was a star of the act, and they weren't, yeah. you know, when you, when you look at the difference between Curly and Shemp, who looked like a man, you know, and a man had been through things, as opposed to this roly poly, you know, modern day, <laughs> you know, early, early day John Belushi type. Uh, they weren't in, they weren't interested. So, you know, well, one of the books you know, mentioned that Mo was, quote, grooming Shemp for a while there before he took over. That was my next question. Was it hard for Mo to convince Shemp to come back full time? Uh, I think it was. When, when he came back full time, Shemp made him put it in writing. This is temporary. You know, this is temporary. And, and I, uh, in the book, I have some of the, the, the contract language in there. You know, as long as, you know, when Jerome Howard is better, uh, uh, Shemp Howard can do his own thing. Shemp Howard can even do his own thing now. You know, he's going to have a salary cap when he goes out, but he can do other work. And he did other work. He, he appeared in another Abbott and Costello picture called Africa Screams, uh, yeah. where he where he pulled out, you know, from his bag of tricks, a different kind of character than he would play in The Three Stooges. Just to go back on, on Shemp's thing, in that dozen years that he was on his own he didn't play the scared character that he played in the in the three stooges all the time going mo there's like there's a ghost here no he he was he had a a, a bunch of characters that he that he could pull out of his bag of tricks he had the the the, the, the loud mouth braggart and he would he would be loud and bragging ha ha and you'd see it in like a film like mr noisy which was very funny uh he had the henpecked husband that he did that a lot in the 1940s and he was very funny at that he played the the one thing, he played the Runyon-esque gangster. He did a bunch of films where he played a gangster. And most of them were comic gangsters. He was in three films based on Damon Runyon. You know, Damon Runyon from Guys and Dolls, where you see Shemp in these films and you go, wouldn't he have been great as a character in Guys and Dolls? He had the face and he was funny. He was in that. And matter of fact, in one film he did, in, in I think it was 1934, it's called uh, Convention Girl. It was set in Atlantic City, and Shemp, and this was this was a film that somehow I think escaped the Hayes Code. It's about a, a woman who sets up other women for dates with gangsters. She was basically was running prostitutes in Atlantic City for gangsters. <laughs> Shemp was one of the gangsters who sets up an extortion scene, a blackmail scheme, and when his partner demands his share of the money, Shemp shoots him and kills him. And he was sort of like a Joe Pesci type of, of gangster. He was like scary. He was a little funny, but really scary. Like, you know, Joe Pesci in Goodfellas. And then he also played, you know, the phony exotic. He was in a Charlie Chan film where he was a, quote, Hindu. But, you know, he was he, he was dressed with a turban and he was wearing a, a loincloth and he was he had brown. He was in brown face, but he's in a police lineup and they push him, pull him down and they scrub him off and they say, you're a phony. You know, and then he starts talking in his Brooklyn accent. And so he, he was able to, and then of course he had the nearsighted blind character, which he used throughout his career. And that's what he used in the film Africa Screams. So he was always able to be popped into films through that dozen years, maybe just one scene or two. It was, it would be a, some comic relief in a drama and it would fit though, because, you know, he was, a, he was a good actor and that was, that was, also why he was very much different than Mo, Larry, and Curly, because I don't think the th any of the three of them could survive as actors outside of the team. And and he proved that he could. I think the I think Mo only made one movie after the after the uh after time caught up with Larry and and um and Joe Dorita. I mean, you know, so uh but the thing about Shemp also 
<clears throat> is that you know he spent about nine years, eight or nine years as a full time stooge, um, and then he nineteen fifty five he he suddenly passes away officially from a heart attack. Now, I don't want to give away too much of your book, but you raise an you raise an interesting point that, well, let's let's face it, these guys they hit each other a lot. And you know, you liken it to a football player who plays who who even though they wear a helmet, they they can sometimes suffer brain injuries. Um you know, uh, you talk about you talk about uh, Curly having a stroke. You talk about Larry having a stroke. Um, Shemp has a heart attack. But in real life, these guys, when they would they would meet their fans, their fans would beat them up also, wouldn't they? Yeah, and Shemp died of a heart attack, according to his death certificate. But his family. His, his daughter-in-law, who's in her 90s, uh, Jerry um, Howard Greenbaum, and his granddaughters, they have a, a Facebook page called the Shemp Howard Goyles. Uh, they, <laughs> they demand, they, they, they say no. You know, Jerry says, I was there. I was there with his wife. I was there with, with, with his son. He died of a cerebral hemorrhage. He did not die of a heart attack. They told us he died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Uh, and, and so that's the family insists that. You go... And, you talk to them today, they'll say, no, no, Shemp died of a cerebral hemorrhage. And when that, the story I told about Hurley being taken off the road and Shemp replaced him in, in New Orleans, they brought Curly back to the, to the sanitarium hosp private hospital in Santa Barbara. And they released, uh, you know, the records of what was wrong with him. And a lot of it had to do with, you know, diabetes and his, his obesity and his, he was a heavy drinker in his hard life. Uh, and he and and he had several strokes, but they also and I noticed this. It said that he also had hemorrhaging in his eyeballs, and so when you look that up and you see what what causes that, uh, it could be it could have something to do with with you know a hard life, but f in most cases it comes from getting slugged in the head, from getting blows there like a boxer, and then you, you look back again. You look at at Joan. Moore's book on Curly, and she tells this story that is quite possibly apocryphal because Mo tells it to a newspaper reporter in the 1950s under different circumstances that they were on the boardwalk in Atlantic City and a kid came up and, and whacked Curly in the back of the head with a cane because he figured that's, you know, Curly could take it. Don't know if that's really true, but she also writes that she would stand in the wings and watch, as a, as a kid, she would watch the three students perform. And she said it, it was sort of horrifying. She would wince every time Mo hit and slapped Curly. She would watch like the spittle fly from Curly's mouth and how hard the hit actually was, then followed by a poke in the eyes. Because you, know, you go back to the, to the Ted Healy days where he would say these slaps have to be heard in the, in the back row. And they weren't using sound effects on stage. Nick Santa Maria, who's a, a, who wrote a, definitive book on the on Abbott and Costello comedies is also a real show business expert. He said that his father told him that he had seen the three stooges perform. And, and Nick said, wow, you know, you must have, they must have been great. And he goes, no, it, it was hard to watch because they were really hitting each other. And Mo always bragged, I was the smart one. I took Ted Healy's place. And Mo is the only one of the three who did not die of a cerebral hemorrhage. He, you know, he he died shortly after Larry of cancer, but you know, Larry too. Larry too died of a cerebral hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. I tell you what, the book is Shemp, S H E M P, and the author is Bert Kearns. I've read the book; it is it is a fun read, and and we didn't go over half of what was in the, half of what you've uncovered in the book. So I urge everybody to, especially if you're a Stooge fan, and even if you're not, just Look at it. I mean, it's an enjoy it's really fun to read. And there's a lot of comedy in it too. <laughs> it's not, yeah. the, not all. <laughs> yes, but there's a lot of info that nobody really has found before. And you've done a great job on this. So I urge everybody to go to Amazon, go to your bookstore. It's out in October, correct? October first. It should be October first. Okay. Bert Kearns, thanks for being on Lights Camera Author. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. So do I. Thank you.